Good morning and welcome to Power for Today Prophetic Ministries with George Dello. And I uh, wanted to welcome everybody on Facebook Live. And all of these videos will, will be uh, posted on Facebook page as well as my YouTube channel, uh, which is George Dello, that you can follow up on these. And I wanted to, to do a video today to follow up on the one that I put up about a week ago, talking about a dream I had, a prophetic word the Lord gave me that... Uh, uh, just took off viral and uh, has been over 130, I think up to 137,000 views already. It's still still climbing. And there was quite a few comments. There was over a thousand comments on them. And, and uh, a lot of the comments were were asking the question, what do we do now? I mean, what do, how do we respond to that? How do we respond to this warning to get ready? And that's what I want to share with you today. I want to tell you exactly what we need to be doing to be ready and to be found, uh, when, you know, these things take place that we're in a place with God uh, that we're ready and uh, uh, to to uh, do our part. So that's what I'm going to share this morning. But before we do that, let's just take a moment and go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to uh, lead us in His truth. Father God, I just want to thank you for this day. I thank you for your mercies that are new every morning, your abundant grace you poured upon us every day. I thank you for your goodness, the land of the living. And I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for the stirring that you're, you're, you're doing in the body of Christ, that you're, you're stirring people's hearts. You're, you're moving us to, to come closer into you, to get into that intimate place with you, Lord God, to be led of your spirit in everything we do so that we can be, uh, go through the things that are coming upon this earth, that we can traverse the things that are before us and, and uh, have you with us, have your spirit to uh, guide us and direct us so that we can have... Uh, uh, Walk in a place of stability, a place of, of safety and refuge in you, Lord God. And as we talked about, uh, you revealed in Psalms 21, to, to just dwell in that secret place of the Most High, to abide under the shadow of your wings, Lord, to, to be in that intimate place with you so that uh, uh, we can be uh, go through things that, that come upon this earth. So Holy Spirit, we just thank you to come, open up the word to understanding, give us a greater revelation, a greater understanding of, uh, uh, of these things and open up the word and uh, anoint it to work effectively in us as you prepare us for the people of God, as you make us ready uh, for uh, the kingdom of God and the things he wants to do. So, Lord, we just thank you for it and uh, have your way today, Lord. Just speak through me and touch each and every life in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Praise God. Well, again, this is George Dello, Power for Today Prophetic Ministries, and uh, we're going to talk about what must we do now? What do we do now? What's next? What's next? Amen. Uh, again, if you haven't seen the video, you can go to my YouTube page or Facebook. Uh, I had a dream and a, a, a prophetic word, and uh, you can watch that. But I want to address those questions. What do we do now? How do we how do we and how do we respond uh, to that warning from God? So uh, that's what I'm going to do this morning. I want to begin uh, again with my part uh, in all of this. How do we respond? Well, uh, I'm responding to God. Uh, to fulfill his calling the ministry to through me he's called me to to be a prophetic voice he's called me to speak uh into the lives of people and to uh, uh make known what god is saying uh to his church and uh in second timothy chapter 4 uh in in verse 1 uh, i'm going to read from uh, the amplified bible second timothy chapter 4 verse 1 through 5 uh, this is what God's called me to do. This is what God's anointed me to do. And this is why I'm doing what I'm doing because I'm going to obey God and I want to be ready. I want to be in that place with God, uh, living a life of obedience and be found when he comes uh, that I'll be ready and waiting uh, as a faithful servant uh, doing what he's called me to do. So he says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge of living and the dead and by in light of his coming of his kingdom herald and preach the word keep your sense of urgency stand by be at hand and ready whether the opportunity seems to be favorable or unfavorable whether it is convenient or inconvenient whether it's welcome or unwelcome you as a preacher of the word are to show people in what way their lives are wrong and convince them rebuking and correcting warning and urging and encouraging them being unflagging and inexhaustible in patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not tolerate, endure sound and wholesome instruction. 
but having itching ears for something pleasing and gratifying, they will gather to themselves one teacher after another to a considerable number, chosen to satisfy their own liking and to foster the errors, the errors they hold and turn aside from hearing the truth and wander off into myths and mad-made fictions. As for you, be calm and cool and steady, accept and suffer unflinchingly every hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fully perform all the duties of your ministry. That's what I'm called to do, to warn, to exhort, to encourage, to, to convict, to, to get people ready for what's coming. Because again, we're, we're living in the fulfillment of these scriptures. We are living in this time where, where many people are, are, are uh, uh, t turning away from the, the, the faith. They're turning away. They can't endure sound doctrine. They're, 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 they're heaping teachers themselves to hear what they want to hear. They want to hear a, a smooth word. They want to hear a good word. They want to hear some kind of blessing, some kind of give me, get me kind of thing. Amen. And, uh, that's, that, we're not, we're living in a day. We, we got to get away from that. We need to get into God. We need to get into Jesus Christ. We got to get into that place of understanding what's going on around us. We, we need that spirit of Issachar to understand these times, what's happening, and, and to uh, uh, be ready to, to go through whatever we have to go through until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you, you know, the Lord is coming back, but he tells us that we're going to go through some things before he does. And uh, 2 Timothy talks to us, tells us that before the Lord comes for his people, that... Uh, there's going to be a great falling away. And that's part of what we're talking about here. That people don't take heed to these warnings. They're going to be a great falling away. And that word that he used for falling away is apostasy. They turn from the faith. And we're seeing that happen all over right now. And he also tells us that he's not coming until the, the, the man of perdition that the, the Antichrist appears. And uh, so there's some things that happen. In the meantime, the church is going to be persecuted. We're going to go through Jesus warned us. I mean, he told us, if you truly love God, if you live a life of race, you will be persecuted. And if we don't believe this, then go back and look at the early church. Read the book of Acts. Read the letters of Paul. Read what they went through, okay? And they were expecting the Lord to come in their day, amen? But look what they had to go through. There, there were over a million martyrs just in those first couple hundred of the years of the church, and you think that, that, that we're not going to go through anything, that we're just live a life of, like, of roses, a bed of roses where everything's just rosy, everything's good, everything, you know, no suffering. Man, we need to wake up to the reality to, uh, of the gospel. If you're a truly believer in Jesus Christ, living in the day and age that we're living in right now, you're going to be persecuted. You're going to come under persecution if you stand up for truth in this hour. And so God's warning us to get ready. And uh, that's what I'm going to share today. I'm going to show you what we need to be doing. I'll begin with Leviticus chapter 20, verse 7 and 8. He said this, Consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. And you shall keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Now I want you to notice what he tells us here. And this, uh, we need to understand these scriptures uh, 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 that, that he's given us. Uh, you're going to find this is a, a, a theme from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, the, the purpose of God for his people is that we be a holy people because he's holy. And, and we're called to walk in agreement with God. We're called to walk together with God. We're called to get into an intimate personal relationship with God. And because God is holy, we have to be holy also. And you'll notice it is always in the context of an experiential holiness, not some 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 uh, uh, positional thing that that so many uh, people in the church today are preaching a positional holiness that that has no reality to it. No, that's not that that's not the the gospel of Jesus Christ. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament preach a holiness that is practical. That we, like he says, keep his statutes. We we obey him. We walk in obedience to God with a pure heart, free from sin. That's what he's talking about. But I want you to notice here the two sides of this that he's telling us. He says, consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy. We have a part to play in this. Our part has to do with our consecration, our willingness, our, our willingness to obey, our willingness to surrender all to God, to consecrate ourselves to God 
Because he does what? He is the Lord who sanctifies us. He's the one who makes us holy. We're not talking about a gospel of works. We're talking about a gospel of grace and faith. God makes us holy. God sanctifies us. He does the work. But he does the work in those that are willing, those that will consecrate, those will 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 give themselves in willingness to obedience for God to do the work. There's a part we play in this. And again, how do we what do we do now? This is where we begin. We have to got to do. We have to come to a place where we come to God, we cast ourselves upon her, we surrender ourselves to God to do this work, to sanctify us, to make us holy, okay? And we're willing to say, God, have your way with us. Bring us to the end of ourselves. Bring us to a place of surrender where we just give up. We, we, we give ourselves wholly to you. And, and I went through this own experience in my own life. And uh, uh, you, can, you can find my testimony on, on, my, uh, uh, on video, on, on Facebook, on YouTube. I also uh, share my testimony and a couple of books I've written. Has anyone seen my Lord and the dunamis power of God? Because God had to bring me to that place also. He brought me to the place where I finally realized that I had to give everything up to God. I had to surrender all. I had to just say, God, I give up. Have your way. You'll be, your will be done, not mine. I surrender completely to you, whatever you want me to do, wherever you want me to go. I am here to do your will. I am here to glorify you in my body and my spirit. I'm here to live for you alone. And that's where God wants every single one of us. That's what holiness is. It's a purity of heart. We no longer live for ourselves. We live for the one who died for us. We've been bought with a price. We're not our own. We don't belong to ourselves anymore. You belong to God. He bought and paid for you with the blood of Jesus Christ. He owns you. You see, we, we've got to come to understanding of the real gospel of Jesus Christ. Why do you think all those, those people in the New Testament, those Christians in the New Testament, died? They were martyrs for Jesus Christ because they lived a life of devotion of God, to God because they weren't their own. They belonged to God. You belong to God. I belong to God. We're called to be His servants. We didn't choose Him. He chose us. He chose us. Why did He choose us? to go and bear fruit, that we would preach this gospel, that we would make disciples, that we would reach the lost, that we would make known God upon this earth. And when we do that, we're going to stir people up. When we do that, we're going to be persecuted. But it doesn't matter because that's what we're called to do. And we have a responsibility to obey God because we're not our own. We're His. We belong to Him. And God's calling upon our lives as every one of us to be His witness Every place we are, wherever God has us, where He would send us, we are to be the witnesses of this gospel, the witness of the kingdom of God, the witness of Jesus Christ upon this earth. That's our calling. That's our purpose. And, in, we're, and much of the church is not doing this. This is why, again, what do we do to, 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 to satisfy the warning of God, to be ready for what's coming upon this earth? We need to get right with God. We need to consecrate ourselves to God, to surrender to God, and allow Jesus Christ to fully sanctify us body, soul, and spirit so that we can fulfill His purpose. We are a, supposed to be a separate people. We're supposed to be purified from all sin and unrighteousness. We're supposed to be consecrated and dedicated to God wholly and completely. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 17, verse 19, He says, For their sakes... This is Jesus talking. He says, for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by the truth. Jesus sanctified himself that we might be sanctified by the truth. It's the word that, that sanctifies us by the, 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 the Holy Spirit through the, 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 the understanding of that word, the truth that sets us free. He sanctifies us by the blood of Jesus Christ. But Jesus sanctified himself. Now we have to understand when we talk about Jesus sanctifying him himself, Jesus had no sin. Jesus was not born with a sin nature. There was no sin in him. He committed no sin. So when Jesus talks about sanctifying himself, what was he talking about? He was talking about his consecration, his devotion to obey God, his will to serve and please God. That was his sanctification. In the same way, when he talks about a Leviticus, we're to consecrate ourselves to be holy that's what we do. We do our part by the same way that Jesus, we give our life, we give our will, we give everything that we have and are to God for His service, for His will and purpose. 
just like Jesus. We come, we present ourselves living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service to do his will, to carry out his plan and purpose, because he's called us to be his witness, to make disciples, to go forth and carry out his ministry and calling that is given to every single saint of God to use the manifestation of his spirit for the profit of all. To bring forth his kingdom upon this earth. To reach the lost with the kingdom of God. In Hebrews chapter 7 verse 26 and 27. He says for such a high priest was fitting for us. Who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. And has become higher than the heavens. Who does not need daily as those high priests. To offer up sacrifices for first for his own sin. And then for the people's. For this he did once for all. When he offered up himself. Again, Jesus didn't have to be sanctified in dealing with sin. Jesus sanctified himself by giving himself to do the will of God. And he did it to the degree that he offered his own body to die upon the cross of Calvary. That was his consecration. We're called to be living sacrifices. We're called to lay down our life to have the life of Jesus Christ. We are called to deny ourselves, take up the cross every day and follow Jesus wherever he wants us to go, to do whatever he wants us to do, to speak whatever he wants us to speak. We're to emulate him. We're to, we're to carry on the work of Jesus the same way that he did it. And you can't do it unless you are consecrated and devoted to God, unless you are given wholly over to him. And only he can produce that in you by sanctifying you because Jesus sanctified himself. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7, he says, Then he said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. Jesus came for one purpose. He came in the flesh for one purpose, to do the will of the Father, to carry out the Father's will. He came. He came to die because that was the will of the Father. He came to die so that we can be sanctified and we can do the will of the Father by the same way that Jesus did that's why he sanctifies. He can give us his spirit so we can carry on the same work that Jesus did. We can take this gospel. We can go to the nations. We can preach this God. We can make disciples. We can walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and reach souls for the kingdom of God. We're to do the same thing. That's why we must be willing to give everything to God, to surrender all to him so that he can sanctify us, make us holy, give us a new heart, remove that ungodly nature of sin that's an enemy with God, give us a new heart, a new spirit, wash us in the blood of a lamb, body, soul, and spirit so we can be fully separated, purified, and consecrated to God to do his will and to please him. In John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18, he says, Therefore my Father loves me. Why? Because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I've received from my Father. Jesus consecrated himself by being willing to lay down his life for the will of the Father. You know what? We have the same ability we can, we can lay down our lives or we can keep it for ourselves. We can either lay down our lives to do the will of God, to consecrate ourselves to him, to give our life to God so he can use us to fulfill his divine purpose, or we can keep it for ourselves. You can make that choice. But let me you, because the Lord tells us when we make that choice, that, that one of the scriptures he tells about the discipleship, he says, if we love our life, if we try to save our life, to have our life, to have our will, he says, we'll lose it. We will lose it if we try to keep our life, if we try to save our life. But if we give up our life, if we give our life to him, we will have his life. We will find his life. We will find real life, the God life. We will find that eternal life. But as long as we're going to hold our life, as long as we're going to hold on to ourselves, to have our will, our way, to be our God, instead of surrendering to him, you're going to lose your life. And, and that's, that's scripture. That's the word of God. We need to understand these things. Jesus set himself apart to do the will of the Father, to consecrate himself to God's holy purpose that we might be sanctified by his blood shed on the cross, that God can work that in us, that he can take away that self. He can take away that old man. He can take away that desire to be worshipped and served, to be our own God, to deliver us from that. 
and to wash us from all the defilement of that and to bring us into this new life, to give us a new heart, a new spirit, to give us a, 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 a new, brand new nature so that we can live a life wholly sold out to God, sold out to Him completely, body, soul, and spirit, to give, be given over completely to His will and purpose. And that's the example we have in the New Testament. That's the early church. That's what I'm saying. They were martyred for their faith. They went through things we can't even imagine for their faith in Jesus Christ and refused to deny Him. Why? Because they were sold out to God. Because they were washed. They were sanctified. They were justified in the name of Jesus by the Spirit of the living God. They were new creation and they lived and walked it out to the cost of their very life. This is the gospel. And, and many people, especially in America, we have no clue about the real gospel of Jesus. We have no clue what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, to walk out a life that pleases God, to be ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming back for a holy church. He's not coming back for a watered-down, sin-stained and, 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 and disobedient church. He's coming back for a glorious church. He's coming back for a holy bride without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. She'd be holy and blameless that, he did, that we're going to be found faithful. We're going to be faithful servants. We're going to be the wise virgins. We're going to be the sheep that are carrying out and doing His will. Not foolish virgins. Not disobedient servants. Not goats. No, a people that are separated and consecrated and devoted to his will and his purpose to carry it out upon this earth. If you want to be ready, if you want to obey the warning of God that he's giving, not just to me, but if, you'll, if you see all the comments on that video I did, I mean hundreds of people were hearing the same exact thing. It's time to get ready. This is how you get ready. Because he's coming back, just read, just read under the power of the Holy Spirit. Ask God to give you the revelation of Matthew chapter 24, Matthew chapter 25. Read every single word in there. Because it tells you exactly what's going to be happening. It tells you exactly what Jesus is coming back for. It's telling you exactly what you must do to be ready when he comes. Because if we're not, we're going to miss the boat. If we're not ready... He's going to shut the door on us. It's not going to be, it's going to be a, a major shock to many people that think, that think, that they think they're ready, that think that they're in, in, in the place of, of, of ready for his coming. And they're going to, they're going to be shocked when Jesus says, I don't know you. You see, we've, we, we've got to get serious. We, we need to wake up to these warnings and we need to begin responding by doing our part as he tells us here. In John chapter 6, verse 38, he says, For I come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Again, it's all about this one thing. Jesus consecrated himself because he came to do the will of God and nothing else. He did nothing in and for himself. The Bible tells, tells us that the same way that he sent Jesus, we're sent the same way. We're to have the same mind of Christ, to be of no reputation, to bond serve the Lord in the spirit of humility, to beat us unto death. We're to have the same mind of Christ, that we don't longer live for ourselves. We live for the one who died for us. We're to have the same mind of Christ, that we are here for one purpose, to fulfill the will of the Father. We are here to serve God, to fulfill his purpose. Why do you think he left us here when he saved us? He could have saved us and took us immediately to heaven. Why? Because he appointed us. He saved us. He called us for the purpose of reaching the lost, of reaching those that don't know God. We are here to please God, just like Jesus did. In John chapter 12, verse 49 and 50, he says, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say, what I should speak. And I know that it is commanded everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. Why did Jesus give us the Holy Spirit? He gave us another comforter. He gave us another helper, a paraclete. He gave us the Holy Spirit 
in order for us to do the same things that Jesus did, to make us the same way that Jesus is, to walk as Jesus walked, to talk as Jesus walked. In other words, we are to be a people of the Holy Spirit. We're to be led of the Spirit of God. The sons of God, the true sons of God, are those that are led by the Spirit of God. We are to walk and move and live in the Spirit of God, to have a spiritual mindedness. We no longer live for ourselves. We no longer live for the flesh. We live and move and work by the Holy Spirit to do the same things that Jesus did. We speak what he speaks. We do what he, what he does, what he shows us to do. Just like Jesus. We are constrained by the Spirit. We're led of the Spirit. We're filled with the Spirit. We're driven by the Spirit. We want to walk in the Spirit. We want to live in the Spirit. We want to have that eternal mindset. We want... Listen. <laughs> I get excited because this is truth. And the church is lacking truth. As I just read a minute ago in, in Timothy, we don't endure sound doctrine. We don't even preach sound doctrine anymore. People are so caught up in the flesh and, the, and, and wanting you know, to be blessed and bless me and have this habit. We don't even have sound doctrine in the church anymore. We got to get back to the truth. We got to get back to the basics. It's time to get ready because things are going to happen. Things are starting to shake in heaven and earth. And I'm telling you what, life as we know it is going to change. And if you're not ready, you're not going to make it through. That's part of the great falling away. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Jesus came for the purpose. He died upon the cross. He gave his life blood for this purpose. To have a glorious church that he might sanctify us, that he might wash us from all sin, body, soul, and spirit, that he might change us into new creation and give us a new heart and a new spirit and a new nature and put his spirit in us so that we can carry on the works of Christ. You, 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 this is the basics. This is the, the simplicity of the gospel. And it's all by faith and grace. Because God is the one that sanctifies us. All we do is we willing. We will to do His will. We surrender. We, we give ourselves to Him. We say, Lord, here am I. Send me. Use me. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 Now may the God of, himself, of peace Himself sanctify you completely. May the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. To be preserved blameless. You can't preserve something until it's in this condition to be preserved. And again, notice he says that when he comes, you're to be found blameless. You're to be found holy. You're to be found sanctified. He's not coming to do it. He's already done it. He's already done it. We just need to surrender and allow it to be done in us. By faith, we take hold of the promise. When you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And who the Son sets free is free indeed. We just got to get serious. We got to consecrate us. We got to get in the word. We got to get into the truth. He says, the, 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 those that abide in the word of God are my disciples indeed. Are you a true disciple? Do you abide in the word? Are you seeking the truth that's going to set you free? See, this is, the, this is how you get there. We got to do our part. We got to get serious. You got to get in the word. You got to get in the spirit. You got to get in prayer. You got to get in worship. You got to get in devotion and consecration. You should have, you should be, you should have a time of, of devotion to God every single day. Why? Because he's supposed to be the preeminence of your life. He is supposed to be your first love. He is supposed to be your priority. Seeking and knowing God should be the greatest desire of your heart. If it's not, something's wrong. That's why Paul says, I, I, I consider everything lost for the excellence of knowledge of Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus, my Lord. I'm willing to suffer the loss of everything, he says. Why? Because I want to know Christ and be found in Him. To be found in Him when Jesus comes. To be found in Him. He says, I want to know Him experientially. I want to know Him intimately and personally. How many people in the church today want to know God like Paul wanted to know God? And because they want to know Him so badly that they're in the Word day and night. They're in the Word seeking Him, searching Him out, learning Him, allowing the Spirit to reveal Him, looking, depending upon that Spirit of wisdom and revelation to know God better, to, to get into that place of intimacy with Him. You see, people aren't ready for what's coming. People aren't ready for the coming of Christ even. People aren't ready because we're not even doing the basics. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12 and 13, Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. 
It's Jesus that does it. Again, it's not what we do. It's what Jesus does. Our part again is to believe. Our part again is to know the truth and to believe the truth and to receive the truth. Our part is to surrender to God and say, Here I am, Lord. Have your way with me. Do whatever you have to do. Sanctify me. Wash me. Purify me. I surrender myself to you. I give you my life. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. There you go. Go after God. Go outside the camp. Get outside your comfort zone. Get outside a church that's not preaching the truth. Go find Jesus. Go after Jesus. Why? Because he is there. He died to sanctify the people with his own blood. He did it outside the gate. We need to go after him. We need to go after him, pursue him for his work to be done, that he bring us into the full redeeming work of Jesus Christ, washed, sanctified, and justified in the name of Jesus by the Spirit of the living God. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin, all sin, every spot, every blemish, every speck. Washed in the blood of Jesus. You see, we have so many people in church don't even believe that the blood of Jesus Christ has enough power to cleanse us from sin. We need to believe. We need to know. His blood is efficacious. His blood can take away the entire sin of this world. Don't you think he can take your sin away? Don't you think he can get the sin out of you? Don't you think his blood can wash the stain to make you whiter than snow? He comes like refiner's fire and for his soap. To do what? To purify you like gold refined in the fire. To remove every speck. Every single spot of sin. To make you perfect, holy, pure, clean. A pure heart, clean hands. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Here it is. He tells us exactly what we need to be doing right now. Every single Christian, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Pursue holiness. What do we do? We're to pursue it. We're to run after it. We're to go for it. We don't just sit around and wait for God. No, we pursue it. That means you run, you, 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 you do something, you get, you move, you get in the word, you get in prayer, you get in the spirit, you cry out to God, you, 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 you consecrate, you surrender, say, God, move, sanctify me, purify me, wash me in the blood, give me the revelation, give me the truth, show me the truth, lead me to the place, Lord God, I surrender, lead me to the place to receive your, your full and redeeming work. Pursue holiness, run after it, chase it. How many people in the church today are pursuing holiness? How many are doing everything in their power to get a hold of this holiness? To be what God has called us to be. To be holy even as he is holy. You see? This is, this is what we've got to get back to. One of the greatest, uh, one of the greatest um, uh, uh, indictments of God against the church was, is found in, in, in Isaiah uh, chapter 64. He, he said this. Uh, about Israel. And again, this applies to us just as well. He, he says, uh, there, there is no one who calls on your name who stirs himself up to take hold of you. There is no one who calls on your name who stirs himself up to take hold of you. That's what we're talking about. And we're living the same way. How many in the church and the church today really seek God, really stir themselves up to take hold of God? To say, so we're going after Jesus. So we're going to get everything God has for us. So we're going to do everything in our power to seek God, to know God, to receive what he has for us. To be the person he's called us to be. Do you pursue God? Are you in the word day and night? Are you in the word? Are you in prayer? Are you in devotion? Are you in there seeking him? Are you in there surrendering and giving yourself? Are you crying out? Are you, are you opening your ears to hear? Are you seeking like, like silver or gold? Are you searching for, for a hidden treasure until God opens his mouth? Until God gives you the revelation that's going to set you free? Are you doing that? Are you just lazing back just waiting for the coming of the Lord? Let me tell you what, there's a whole lot of people just laying around waiting for the coming of the Lord. And when he comes, they're going to be shocked because they're not ready. We need to do our part. 
This is our consecration. We're to pursue holiness. We are to seek God with our heart saved and soul and saved. We're to stir ourselves up. That means we gotta we gotta make an effort. We gotta get off the couch. We gotta turn the TV off. We gotta get away from the cubicle. We have got to begin to stir ourselves to go after God like we've never gone after Him before. Because this is eternal life. We're talking about life and death here. We're, we're, we're talking without holiness, nobody shall see the Lord. Without holiness, nobody shall see the Lord. Meditate on Get that in your heart. Get that in your spirit. Without holiness, nobody shall see the Lord. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12 and 13. Well, we just read that one. 1 Peter 3, 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Again, this is our part. We must give our hearts to God. We must give ourselves to God. We must surrender all to Him. That God be sanctified in our hearts. In other words, our heart is given wholly to God. We don't give it to flesh. We don't give it to the old man. We don't give it to us. No, we give our heart to God. We give our heart, we give it all to God. We give our life to God. We give our soul to God. We give our body to God. Everything is to be dedicated and consecrated to God. Surrendered to glorify Him. We glorify Him, body, soul, and spirit. Everything. Why? Because God, people need to see. The lost need to see Christ in us. The lost need to see the love of Christ, the obedience of Christ, the, the, the righteousness of Christ. It's our, it's, it's, it's our obedience, our righteousness that brings them to God. When they see God's glory, when they see His righteousness are burning towards, even kings and Gentiles will be, be, be drawn to the brightness of His rising in us. They have to see Christ in us. They have to see the reality of Christ. We turn people off when we, when we live a life of, of sin and we look just like the world. We turn them off. We turn them away from God. We're, we're to live a life that, that, that shows forth God's love, that shows forth God's, God's goodness, that shows forth uh, God's, uh, 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 God's righteousness and holiness. That's what's going to draw people to God. And, and uh, he, he, he tells us in uh, Proverbs that uh, when we live a life uh, when a righteous man falters, Okay, a righteous man who falters before the wicked is like a murky spring and a polluted well. That's, that's uh, uh, Proverbs 25, 26. A righteous man who falters before the wicked is like a murky spring and a polluted well. What's he saying? When, when we claim to know Christ, when we live a life claiming that we are a Christian and we live a life of sin, what are we doing? We're dirty the water. Who wants to drink dirty water? Who wants to drink polluted water? Nobody does. Nobody does. If we can't show them something different, if we can't show them a people that have been supernaturally changed by God that now live a life of, of love and righteousness and obedience, that live in unity with one another, that, that show forth something that the world needs, then we're not going to draw them in the kingdom of God. Amen. That's why Jesus said, either be hot or cold, don't be lukewarm. At least if you're cold, you're not talking about Jesus. You're not misleading people. If you're hot, they're going to see Christ in you. But when you're lukewarm, you muddy the waters and you turn people off. That's one of the biggest reasons why people don't go to church. Because they think it's full of hypocrites. Full of hypocrites. Because we don't live the life. We don't walk in newness of life. We don't walk out the, re the redeemed work that Jesus has done in us. That we don't look like Jesus. We don't talk like Jesus. We don't walk like Jesus. This is why he sanctifies. This is why he does this work. So that we look just like Jesus. He's empowered us to do it. He puts his spirit in us. He takes away everything that's old. Everything that's, that's, that's sinful. He cuts all of it out. He makes everything brand new. A new heart. A new spirit. A new nature. And the Holy Spirit. He causes us to obey him. He gives us the very nature of God, righteous and holy. What does your nature do? It's what determines your fruit. When you have a nature of righteousness and holiness, what's your fruit? Righteous and holy. Amen. Just study about the trees. When Jesus talks about the, 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 the parable, or the, he uses a type of trees. A good tree bears good fruit. A bad tree bears fruit, bad fruit. Read those scriptures in Matthew and Luke and study what he's talking about. He's talking about Jesus came to make us good trees so we can bear good fruit. He gives us a good heart because out of the heart comes what's in it. If it's a good heart, it's going to bring good things out. Amen. If it's a righteous heart, it's going to bring righteousness out. 
John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my words, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If we don't abide in the words, you'll never know the truth. You've got to go after truth. You see, what, what releases the power of God is revelation. What releases the power of God is revelation. You have to get in the Word. You have to study the Word. You have to ask the Holy Spirit to give you the revelation. You see, when, when, when the Holy Spirit opens the Word to your understanding, it produces revelation. Revelation produces faith, and faith releases the power of God to receive the promise of God. That's why you have to abide in the Word until you know, until you know the truth, until you know the truth by revelation. You know that you know that you know God has illuminated you with the truth that sets you free. Just read about the the the, the uh the, 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 the word and the, and the sower, the seed, the, the word and the sower. Just read about the, 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 the parable he gives about sowing the seed, the word. Because if you don't get the revelation, if you don't have a heart to understand what he is saying, the devil comes and just steals the word out of you. It never produces fruit or it gets choked or, 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 or you know, you get, you get, you get persecuted and you, and you fall away. All of this works together. This is all about the gospel. It's all about the full redeemed work of Christ. So we can stand, we can last, we can live and walk like Jesus. In Romans chapter 6, verse 10 and 11. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also, in other words, in the same way that Jesus did it. What did Jesus do? He died once to sin so he can live forever for righteousness. He says in the same way, you also reckon yourselves be, to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. To be dead to sin means you have no more relationship with it. You ever hear somebody say to one of their kids, maybe the, 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 some, the kid has done something so bad to the father, the father goes to the son and says, I'm dead to you. I'm dead to you. What's he saying? I got nothing to do with you no more. I have no affection for you. I have no relation with you no more. We're dead. There's no relationship anymore. That's what he's talking about here. We're dead to sin through this work of Christ. We have no relation. We have no affection for sin anymore. We have no affection for this world. We have no affection for, 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 for sin and for, and, and, for, and for this old man. It's dead. It's over. It's finished. I'm dead to that. I have no affection. I have no desire. I have no relationship with sin anymore. No. What do I have? I have a relationship to God. I am alive to God in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Let me just read this again in the Amplified Bible. Let me, let me read this in the Amplified Bible. He says, For the, by the death he died, he died to sin, ending his relationship with, to it once for all. And the life that he lives, he is living to God in unbroken fellowship with him. Even so, consider yourself also dead to sin and your relation to it broken, but alive to God, living in unbroken fellowship with him in Christ Jesus. Living in unbroken fellowship every minute of every day is not coming and going. It's not back and forth. It's abiding. It's staying upon. It's living in. We are in Christ. We abide in Christ. We abide in the vine, receiving that ceaseless supply of oil from the anointed one, receiving that ceaseless supply of divine life flowing into us from the vine. We are attached. We are abiding in the vine. We stay forever in the vine. Meaning we live a life of obedience to God. We live a life of, of, of living for God. Just look up what it means to be in Christ. Look what it means. Look at all the scriptures that talk about abiding in Christ, being in Christ. And you'll find that every single one talks about you live a life for God. You are living an unbroken fellowship with God. You live a life of, of obedience, of following, of obeying Him, serving Him, pleasing Him, glorifying Him. You live for God. That's what it's all about. This is what Jesus came to do. To make us a people just like Him that abide. Because listen, let me tell you a secret. You want to see the glory of God? You want to walk in the power of God? You want to see God's manifestation upon this earth? Here's the secret. Everything Jesus did, he, he did through his abiding with the Father. Everything that Jesus did flowed out of his divine relation with the Father. It flowed out of his oneness with the Father. It flowed out of his abiding with the Father. It was, the, it was God working through him. It was it, everything he did, the miracles, the glory, everything. It came through his union with the Father. Now, guess what? Jesus is the anointed one. 
If you want to walk like that, if you want to see the glory of God, everything that God wants to do is going to flow through your oneness with Christ. It's going to flow out of your union with Christ. It's going to flow out of your body with Christ. It is Christ that does the work through you. If you want to see the glory of God, you've got to get into that place of abiding with Christ. He is the one that's going to flow through you. You see, that's what it means to abide in the vine. And I, and I like what he tells us back in, in, in uh, uh, Zechariah. You know, he gives us an example of this in, in uh, uh, Zechariah, what it means to, to really abide in that place with him and uh, receive that anointing. And uh, let me just read this real quick to you. Um, Zechariah chapter 4 in verse 2, he says, what do you see? I said, there's a lamp stand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. On the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes of the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right hand of the bowl and the other to his left. And he says, uh, 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 he goes on and talks about, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. But then back uh, down in verse uh, uh, 12, what are these two olive vans that drip into the receptacles of the two gold pipes from which the golden oil drains? He says, these are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. Okay? When we stand before the Lord, when we're united to Christ, when we're in that place with Him, we receive that supply of the anointing, the supply of His glory, the supply of His power from Him. As we abide in Christ, that flows through us in order to touch those around us. Okay, It takes that abiding. Everything we do is just like Jesus. We speak what He speaks. We do what He does. We go where He, he wants us to go. We abide in Him and He flows through us to bring forth the work and manifest Himself upon this earth. Signs, wonders, and miracles, the glory of God, and all of these things. But again, we got to get into this place where we live in unbroken fellowship with Him in Christ Jesus. We're not in today and out tomorrow. We, you know, we're not living in sin today and then right. No, no, you abide. You stay upon. You cling to. You hold fast. You live every moment of every day being living in the Spirit of God by the Spirit of God. Now listen, we all make mistakes. We all slip up. We all fall. But what do you do? You repent and get back on your feet. You repent and get the blood of Christ. He forgives you and cleanses you from all unrighteousness. He restores you to the place where you can go forward and just keep on going but you don't live in it you don't stay in the pig pen you don't stay in the slop you don't sit there in the vomit amen you move out you get out you clean up and you move forward you keep going get back get right with god wherever you are right now get right with god repent ask god to clean you up ask god to forgive you ask god to wash you in the blood again go back to the cross and get it right it's not too late He's waiting for you. He's waiting for you. He's calling you right now. That's why he's warning us. He's calling you right now. Get it right. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. His divine power, his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. What's he saying? God gives us everything we need to be righteous and godly. God gives us everything we need to be holy. God gives us everything we need to walk in obedience. God gives us everything we need to exemplify him upon this earth. How? Through the knowledge of Christ. Through the knowledge of Christ, who called us by glory and virtue, by, by which have been given to us, what? His exceedingly great and precious promises. Exceedingly great and precious promises. Exceedingly great and precious promises. Why are they exceedingly great and precious? Because they can sanctify you. They can wash you. They can cleanse you. They can change you. They can bring you into a new creation. They can make you alive to God and dead to sin. They can change you completely, totally, body, soul, and spirit. His promises... Faith in the promises of God, knowing the truth that sets you free, will change your life forever. Change your life forever. Set you afire. Amen. I'm a fireball because God set me afire. I'm a fireball because God got a hold of me and changed my life. God will do it for you. I'm, no, I'm nobody special. I just made up my mind. I'm going after God. I'm pursuing God. I'm running after God. I'm doing everything my, I can to have everything of God. I just want God. I want to see the glory. I want to manifest the glory. I want to walk in the glory. I want to see what nobody's ever seen. I want to do what no one's ever do. I'm going after God. I'm going to be ready. Watching, waiting. Like I said in the very beginning, I'm going to fulfill my calling to herald and preach the word of God. 
to exhort, to, 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 to encourage, to rebuke, to tell people what, how they're loving, to do whatever I have to do in order to get the church right, in order to reach souls in the church that need to get right with God, that need to get sanctified and washed and, and regenerated and renewed and walk in this newness of life, to revive them, to awaken them to the truth that will set them free. That's what I'm about. So he says, by which may give us exceedingly great and precious promise that through these promises, when the light comes on, when the revelation comes through these promises, you may be partakers of the divine nature. You partake of the very nature of God, Christ in us, the hope of glory. That nature of righteousness and holiness that is created in God's own image. That nature that enables us to walk in righteousness and holiness before God all the days of our life. But notice again, the very last part of this, you have to first having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. He's got to first take out the old before you put on the new. He's got to take off the old man before you put on the new man. You have to have your mind renewed in the midst of it. But you have to get rid of the old before you put on the new. There's no mixture. There's no, there's no, there's no, no, no mixture. You can't, you can't have the two together. It, no, God called us to be one or the other. You're either in the flesh or the spirit. It's one or the other. You're either, you're either in the lust of the flesh or you're in the fruit of the Spirit. It's one or the other. And like Jesus said, you'll know them by their fruits. You'll know them by their fruits. You'll know whether or not they're truly in there with Christ by their fruits. The lust of the flesh or the fruits of the Spirit. Those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its, with its lusts and desires. They're dead to sin. They're dead to that thing. It's out of them. It's gone. They put off the old man. Jesus did it. He crucified. He, he circumcised that old stony heart of flesh. He circumcised that old. He took that sin out of you. Now we walk in this newness of life. Now we walk in this new nature of righteousness and holiness. Amen. So let me, let me give you one more in Haggai, the book of Haggai, uh, chapter, uh, 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 chapter two, I believe it is. But anyway, uh, this is the key and this is why I'm going to pray for all of you right now. Uh, Haggai, was about a people of the people of Israel that they had gotten caught up in the affairs of this life. They were distracted with building their own houses, just like that warning I gave in that dream and the, and the prophecy. They were distracted building their own houses, you know, living their own life, getting the things for themselves, just about themselves, 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 and neglecting the house of God. They were neglecting the house of God, just like we're seeing today. The church is filled with people like Haggai's, uh, the days of Haggai, that are distracted. The enemy's got them distracted. They're doing every single thing except what they ought to be doing, except what they ought to be about, except seeking God, pursuing God, consecrating themselves to God, surrendering to God, getting a hold of God, stirring themselves to, to get God, to get in that place, to be right with God. They were doing everything except. But here's what the Bible says in Haggai. When we, when God sees that we have a heart after Him, when God sees that we're ready, He's going to do this. He said, he stirred up the spirits of the people. He stirred up the spirits of the people to work on the house of the Lord. He stirred up the hearts of the people, the spirits of the people to work on the house of the Lord. This is the house of the Lord. This is the house of the Lord. This is the temple of God. God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you begin to stir up the spirits of your people all through the church. Oh God, all through the church, all of these people, Father God, that are lukewarm, that are backslidden, that are, that are complacent, that are, that, that are falling aside, Lord. I pray, Father, right now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, you begin to stir, to convict, to cut to the heart, to stir up their spirits, to come and work on the temple of the Lord, to work on this house of God, to, to, to stir themselves up to do what needs to be done, to pursue you, to seek you, to pursue holiness, to cry out, to lay themselves at the cross, at the, the foot of the cross, and say, Lord, here am I. Touch me, sanctify me, wash me, cleanse me, purify me, make me right with you. Bring me in that place, O oh God, dead to sin and alive unto you, to live in fellowship with you all the days of my life in the name of Jesus. God, I pray. Convict your church. Convict your people, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, move on the hearts and open the blinded eyes. Break through the darkness of our sin. Help them to see the reality, the truth of where we are, each and every one. Where are we really in our relationship with you? Are we on fire? Are we cold? Are we lukewarm? Lord, show us the truth. 
and convict us, Lord. If we need to be changed, do it, Lord. Give us a heart after you. Begin to move upon us like never before. Shake everything in us. Shake our, our hearts, our minds. Do whatever it takes, Father God, to get us to play. We'll begin to cry out, begin to pursue, begin to chase you, begin to go after you like never before until we get a hold of the promise, until we get the revelation, until the work is done and we are washed, sanctified, and justified in the name of Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit of God. Lord, prepare your glorious church, prepare your holy bride without spot or wrinkle or any such thing to be holy and blameless in love, to do your will, to live for you alone, to be your disciples, to walk in that place with Jesus and all pleasing to you, that we will glorify you upon this earth all the days of our lives in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, praise God. I want to thank everybody for being here. This is going to be on Facebook and YouTube. And in just a few minutes, I'll get on YouTube. I encourage you, share this video. Tell somebody they need to hear this. The, the, you know, we, we had, a, I think, 137,000 people watch my video on the dream and, and the uh, 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 prophecy that God had given me. Every one of them needs to hear this follow-up because this is how you get to the place. This is how you respond to the warning of God. This is how you get ready for what's coming upon this earth so that when, when it happens, we'll, we'll make it through. We'll, 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 we'll be those that are on the solid rock of Jesus Christ, obeying Him building the foundation on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. When the storm comes, when the wind blows, we will stand in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to stand in Jesus' name. Amen. God loves you. That's why he's telling the truth. I love you. That's why I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> Amen. This is it. This is it. And, and uh, uh, you want more of this, brother? I got over 500 videos on Facebook, YouTube right now. You can get them all. Amen. They're all there for the taking. And it's all the word, the word, the word, the word, the word, because that's what's going to set you free. So God bless you. I appreciate you being with me. Listen, if you're, if you're good with God and, and you're right with God, just keep looking up. Your redemption draws nigh. And uh, we're one day closer to the coming Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a fact you can take to the bank. Amen. We are one day closer and he's coming soon. The signs are around us. Again, read Matthew 24, read Matthew 25. And according to that, uh, the scriptures God gave me in that warning, get in Psalms 91, immerse yourself to, to have that, to walk in that promise. It's not Psalms, 9, uh, Psalms uh, 91 and also Matthew 7, Matthew chapter 7, I believe it was uh, the last verses of uh, 7, 24 through 26 about uh, uh, being either on the rock or the sand. You better have, make sure your foundation is right because the storm's coming on both and only one's going to stand. I want to stand. Amen. I love you. Appreciate you. God bless you. Share this. Tell somebody about Jesus and be blessed. Have a wonderful day, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.